Amen. So we're there in John chapter 13, of course, a uh, great chapter. Jesus really gives us an example of what it is to serve one another and to love one another. He says there a new commandment in verse 34, I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And really what I want to just preach about tonight is, uh, well, the title of the sermon is, is Love the Brethren. Love the Brethren. Now, I promised you this morning that there would be a kinder, gentler sermon, so... <laughs> I'm following through on that, but it's an important topic. You know, I'm not just preaching it just because you know, you know, we want to tone things down a little bit tonight and make everybody feel okay. But it's an important topic because we're commanded to love one another. We're commanded to love the brethren, and it's something that uh, you know. I don't think we're struggling here in this church. I don't think we. I think everyone in this church, we're a small group, and everyone knows each other well and is getting to know each other better. And everybody loves here. But it's always good to have sermons like this as a kind of a pre or a pre uh, preemptive, you know. Um, just, uh, uh, I guess I want to say, uh, you know, just a maintenance sermon, that type of a sermon, where we're doing preventative maintenance, that's the word I'm looking for, where we're just going to try and keep things kind of the way they are, and maybe if there are some areas we can improve in, by all means, let's do that. But um, <clears throat> what we need to understand, because uh, we are in a church that's made up of people, obviously, is that we all have an influence on each other. Everybody's going to have an influence on one another, and that that's going to happen for better or worse. You know, we're not going to be able to just come to church and, and come and go and, and not have an influence. You are going to affect other people when you come to church. You're going to affect other people in every area of your life, every area that you come into contact with people. Uh, this is something that's very important that we understand, the fact that we have an influence on other people, for better or worse. I mean, we can think about all the different relationships that we have for uh, influences on people. And I think one that, you know, on Father's Day, we would probably highlight a little bit, the effect that we can have on our children. We influence our children for better or worse. And that's a very power in, powerful influence. I mean, we can, as parents, you know, change the entire course of our children's lives, be it for good or evil. You know, the Bible reads in Colossians 3, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be, be, be discouraged. I really don't want to break down the minutia of that verse and, and talk about what it's you know, explaining about, but just briefly, it's basically, I think, what it's showing us is that uh, we shouldn't have unreasonable standards, or we shouldn't, uh, you know, uh, give our, frustrate our children to the point, well, um, you know, unreasonably to the point where they're going to lash out at us in, in, in wrath and anger. You know, that's one area that we can talk about where our influence is very powerful. Another influence or area of our life that's very powerful would be as friends. You know, we have a lot of friends. Hopefully, we're making friends here at church and, and elsewhere. And, and uh, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, the man that uh, hath friends must show himself friendly. You know, people that don't have a lot of friends, it's usually because they're not very friendly people. You know, we meet these people out soul winning. You know, I go out knock, knocking doors, and I, I remember I was in Ahwatukee just this last day. All the bad examples come from Ahwatukee, by the way. I knocked on the door, and I just the guy opened it, and I, did, I didn't even get to say hi. I'm Corbin from Baptist Church. He just opened the door, saw the Bible, and said, no. Closed the door like that. You know, which I like. I like it when they just, just get it out. Let me know whether you're interested or not. But I, I, I walked away thinking, I bet that guy doesn't have a lot of friends. I bet he's probably a bit of an angry person. Maybe I just caught him on a bad day, I don't know. But the point is, if we want to have friends, we have to have the proper influence on people. Yeah. We're not going to, you know, you draw more, uh, you, you catch more flies with honey than, or than vinegar, as the saying goes. If you want friends, you have to show yourself friendly. Uh, we could talk about, even with strangers, even just in your day-to-day -day interactions, the influence that you have on other people. I mean, think about it. If you're working in, you know, any type of public service where you're interacting with the public, you know, you run into that one bad customer or you run into that one bad, uh, you know, employee at the place that you're, you know, you're shopping at or whatever. I mean, you could walk away from that. You, you have the one interaction on the road, right? That's, that's what we can all relate to. Is the, the person who cuts you off or, or, or stops short or what, whatever goes on the road or, you know, just our interactions with complete strangers even. They, they have, can have such a powerful influence on the way we behave and the things that we do and, and, and affect our entire day. So we have influence on each other. And really what I want to focus on tonight is the influence that we have on one another as church members. I mean, if we're going to be coming to church faithfully and regularly and we get to know each other, you know, we're going to have influence on one another. We're going to influence each other for good and we're going to, you know, hopefully that's it. You know, but there, there could be times when we find ourselves, uh, you know, maybe influencing somebody uh, in a negative way. We want to avoid that. So we would like to think that our influence within the church is always going to be positive. I mean, that's what we should aim for. That's, what, that's the goal. That when we come together as, as a body in Christ, that we're going to be 
helping each other, influencing each other to uh, live for Christ and to do the right thing and, and to encourage one another. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 27, iron, as iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So it's talking about using that illustration of how when iron, you know, use iron to sharpen iron, it becomes more useful, whatever that instrument is made of iron, be it an axe or a sword or a knife, it's hard to use, you know, a cutting instrument that's dull. And he's saying, well, you got to take iron to iron and sharpen it. And it's the same with the way with us within the church, that we need to come together not to dull one another, not to, you know, put a dent in the blade, not to chip away at each other, but to actually sharpen one another so that we can be more effective for Christ. That's the, that's the ideal. But if we're not careful, what can happen within a church is that, you know, we could, the, the reality of, of, of the proverb might read as nails scraping across a chalkboard. So a man vexes his friend, right? That can happen in, with people. And they can start to influence each other the wrong way, and then people get bitter, people get angry, and even though we might mean well, we've offended somebody, and it's just like those nails scraping across, you know, the chalkboard, which, which nobody can really stand. But, you know, here's the thing. Here's why we have to preach this and, and understand this, is because of the fact that we're trying to avoid that. We're trying to avoid that. And what you need to understand that people are going to have an influence on you, and if, if you keep coming to church, and, and as the church grows... It's only a matter of time until somebody offends you in some way. It's only a matter of time before somebody looks at you the wrong way or you come in on a bad day and you say the wrong thing or they say the wrong thing to you or they don't say the right thing or, or whatever it is. There's going to be something because we're human and we're all sinners and we're all going to make mistakes. And as the church grows and as people spend more time together, you know, they're going to offend each other. I remember... It was, I don't know if anybody else experienced this phenomenon growing up, but I had certain friends as a child, and it, there was, it just seemed like there were, even my siblings, it seemed like there was just a window of time that we could spend together before we got on each other's nerves. You know, it was about, about two, to, two to four hours, maybe, with a certain sister, right, that, that we could get along and everything was great, but then we just got sick and tired of each other. And I'd have those friends, like, he could stay at my house, I could stay at his house, we could hang out, but after about 48 hours... You know, we needed to just take some time apart. So as we spend time together as a church, you know, over the year, over the months and years, coming to church, in and out, being faithful to services, you know, it's only a matter of time to maybe you're going to reach that, that window with somebody and say, you know what, I need to take a break from this person or I need a little bit of time off. And maybe not. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. But the fact is, it really, it's just a matter of time until somebody says or does the wrong thing and you get offended. Because we're all going to have an influence on each other. Now what really matters is how you respond to that. How do you respond when somebody rubs you the wrong way or says the wrong thing? Your response is what matters. Because your response is, is, is also going to have influence as well. You know, it's either going to escalate the situation or it's going to, make, or it's going to de escalate the situation. You now you're there in John chapter uh, 13, if you would, uh, turn over to John chapter 15. Jesus, you know, thought this was so important that he reiterates this commandment in the end of the book of John. He says in John 15 verse 12, this is my commandment. So this isn't just his suggestion or, you know, his philosophy on life. This is something that God actually commands us. He says that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all the things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that ye should ask, uh, that ye should, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my, in the, ask of the Father in my name, he, will, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. So it sounds like loving one another is a command. I mean, we've read it several times just here in the book of John alone. That we are to actually love one another. And, and you know, that word love today just gets thrown, thrown about real loosely. And a lot of people have, I think, a misunderstanding of what, of what love is. You know, of course, love is a feeling. Love is something that we probably feel towards our spouse, right? At least we should, I hope, right? But, you know, I, I hope you don't feel that same love toward me. <laughs> you know, like, oh, every time I look at you, I get those butterflies. In my like, Whoa, there, you know, and back up. But we are to love one another. So it's not, it can't be just this, you know, this, this lovey-dovey, this Hollywood type of right. love that they put out there. But there is a real love that we are to have one to another as believers. 
And really, Jesus describes what that love is like. And really, we have to understand that love, yes, it's an emotion in, in many instances, but it's also, and it's also manifests itself through actions, right. through what we do, through our behavior. And that's what Jesus gives us. He gives us the example. He didn't just say, you know, love one another and walk away. He actually gave the example when he girded himself and served them and washed their feet, when he, uh, you know, humbled himself. That's why he says there in verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So if we're wondering how it is we ought to love one another, how it is that we ought to make sure we're having the right influence in church with one another as, as believers, as the body of Christ, all we have to do is look at this example of Christ and say, how is it that he loved us? And understand that that's how we are to love one another. We have to consider the manner in which Christ loved us. So how did Christ love us? Well, he loved us when we were an offense to him. You know, we were talking about just a minute ago how the fact that we are going to offend one another. You know, if we if, eventually, you know, maybe never, maybe two people are going to get along great and just no one's ever going to get upset with each other. But the fact is, is that we are going to offend somebody sometime. And we have to understand something that even when we are an offense to someone else, that we need to learn to love that person. If someone offends us, we need to learn to love that person. Because that is how Christ loved us. If you would turn to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2. He loved us when we were an offense unto him. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, I'll begin reading in verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that thou worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all we also all had our conversation in times past and the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Christ, for by grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together to make us sit in heavenly places, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through uh, Christ Jesus. So this verse is clearly showing us that there was all a time in our lives when we were an offense unto God, when we were dead in trespasses and sins, when we were walking in the spirit of disobedience. And even then, even at that time in our life, that God had great mercy upon us. And he not only that, he had great, he showed his grace on us. And how did he do that? In his kindness towards us. You know, I heard this a long time ago in the workplace, you know, somebody had probably done something, if I were to recall the details, I'm sure it was very trivial and, and, and you know, non-important. But boy, it, it made, made me mad. It really upset me. And I was talking to somebody else at work about what they had done. And I remember they just said, you know what? You need to just kill them with kindness. Just kill them with kindness. And that's something I've tried to remember throughout the years and something I've tried to implement in my life a little bit. And there's been times when I've been able to do it a little bit more successfully than others, but I find that that works. That often if you're having an issue with somebody, if you just, instead of just escalating the situation, you know, and throwing gas on the fire, if you would just show kindness towards them. A lot of times that brings them around. And you can find yourself almost, you know, better off than where you start, you know, better friends than when you began. So that's really, been that, and that is kind of how what God did with us. Is it, is it not? It says there that, in, uh, according, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. God showed kindness unto us in Christ when we were yet dead in trespasses and sin, when we were yet an offense unto Christ. So, you know, somebody comes in and just offends you in some way. You know, and I'm sure in whatever way somebody's going to offend you is going to pale in comparison to the way that we were an offense unto God. I mean, it's not even, it's not even comparable. So just keep that in mind that if somebody does something or says something that offends you, you know, that God has forgiven you much more. So that's one way that we need to consider the manner in which Christ loved us. Another way that we can consider the manner in which Christ loved us is that He loved us not in word, but also in deed. I mean, it's one thing to just say, hey, I love you. You know, I love you, man. You know, and, and, and then not think another thing about that person. Or not care about what they're going through, or or consider them, or not. You know, it's it's something to just say that. It's another thing to actually show these things, or, or to actually genuinely love somebody, because it's going to again manifest itself as it did with Jesus. I mean, he, you know, like I said, he's the one who gave us the example there in John 13, where he showed the love that he had. I mean, he went on to show that love when he went and bore the cross and died for us. Right. It's not just that oh God for God so loved the world and it was just a, just words only. Yeah. He actually lived that out and showed us how much He loved us. So that's one of the other thing we need to do. We not need to just love 
when we are an offense unto others or others have offend, offended us, but we also need to love not in word, but also in deed. He says there in John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So he's saying, this is the example, as I have loved, that's how you were to do it. And he says in verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, I don't know, if I, it'd be really easy to say I could get up here and just say, you know what, I'd catch a bullet for anyone of you. I don't know if that's true. And I pray I never have to find out, right? But I mean, isn't that kind of what Jesus did for us? I mean, he, was, he loved us so much that he was able to lay down his life. And he said, greater love hath no man than this. But people do do that. You hear about sometimes people doing this for one another. You hear about the old the war stories of, of some a grenade gets thrown in the foxhole and one of the men, without even thinking about it, just jumps on it to save his friends that are near him, his fellow soldiers. I mean, that has, that's either in you or it isn't. You either have that kind of love or you don't. You don't, get to, you don't get to think in a moment like that of whether or not you're going to act that out. And of course, we're probably never going to be, be in a situation like that. But we could you know, apply that to our lives often like, Thinking, you know, what if what if something were to happen where we had to, you know, uh, sacrifice ourselves in some way for somebody, or put ourselves through something, or maybe how about this? Just get over it. Just get over something that somebody offended us. In, you know, either you're going to have that in you, or you're not. Either you're going to say, you know what? I can just forget about the way I'm feeling right now. I can just forget, get over myself, and I can just lay down my own, you know, selfishness. I can just lay down my own self-interest. And, and, and the way that I'm feeling or the way you have offended me and just get over it. Either you're going to have that in you either, or you're not. You're not going to sit, be able to sit there. You know, when that grenade comes flying in, the guy doesn't sit there and think about, well, if I jump on that grenade, then this, there's potential. There's no time to think about that. You either have that, you can either act on that in that instant, or you can't. <clears throat> so we see that we are to love not in word only, but also in deed. And that deed really is when we lay down our life for our friends. We love one another when we begin to put others first. If you're still in Ephesians, I should have to stay there. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5. You're going to Ephesians 5, I'll remind us again of the love that Christ has showed towards us. It says in Revelation chapter 1, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and it wasn't just words. It wasn't just that God loved us. It goes on and says, And washed us from our sins in his own blood. I mean, greater love hath no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. And that is exactly what Christ did. You're there in Ephesians chapter 5. Be their followers, God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. You know, we might never have to get to the point in our life where we're going to literally lay down our life for our friends. But if we're not even willing to just carve out some time or, you know, make a phone call or maybe just a text message or just let them know that, hey, we're thinking about you or, 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 or whatever it is. I mean, that is so simple. If you can't do something as simple as that, there's no way in the world you're ever going to have that kind of love where you're going to be willing to lay down your own life. And I don't think that you have to do that in order to show how much you love somebody. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to prove that, hey, I love you, man. Tink, and <laughs> jump on their grenade, you know, just to prove it. You don't have to look for the, the bullet to jump in front of. You can show somebody you love them by giving up a little bit of your own time, you know. Like, what's what's the, the one thing, like, this is a good example, you know, moving. That's when you find out who your friends are. <laughs> when you move, right? When you start, hey, I'm moving. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, man, look at the time, because you know what's coming next. I'm moving this Saturday. I'm going to start early about 9 o'clock. And then it's like, oh, really? All right. You doing anything? <laughs> everyone gets nervous because everyone loves moving, right? Everyone loves moving other people even more. So, and by the way, if you're that guy, at least take the time to box this stuff up. That's all I'm asking. The guy who doesn't say, hey, help me move literally everything into a box and then the box is your You know, moving's fine, but just, you know, do your part too. But I mean, that's what, the point I'm trying to make is that if we really love one another, you know, yeah, maybe we never have to lay down our life, but can we at least maybe just give of our time, of our energy, of our, our thoughts. The Bible says in 1 John 4, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So we see that, you know, uh, the influence that we ought to have on one another is that we should love one another. And that we should forgive one another. And we should be willing 
to love even when others have offended us, and we should be willing to love not only in word but in deed. And that we do that by putting other people first. And, you know, just moving on here in the sermon, Christ's example of sacrifice, you know, it serves as an example but not a benchmark. You know, I was kind of alluding to this already, that Christ, Him laying down His life, that that's an example. That's not something we necessarily have to strive for, you know, looking for that opportunity to jump on that grenade. We can love each other in very practical ways. There are some very practical ways that we can love each other, and not just moving, by the way. You know, you don't have to go through that pain and agony. <clears throat> we can love each other in very practical ways. If you would, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. What are just some practical ways that we can show that we love the brethren? That's the title of the sermon tonight. And it's important that we do that, because we're commanded to do it, first of all. Well, here's one way we can do it, is by greeting each other. That's easy to do now while we're a small church. You know, and, and I, but I've been part of a church now that has been started out as a smaller church and has grown into a, a, quite a large church. And it gets harder. You know what? This gets harder to, fill, to fulfill sometimes. It says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. Now, caveat here, okay, the, whole, the whole kissing thing, that was a cultural thing. You know, a simple handshake will suffice. Okay? Right. Don't, don't be, unless you're in some country, maybe that's their custom. They can grab you and just mwah mwah and they, they do that. But here in America, you know, just bump the knuckles. You know, slap me on the back if you need to, whatever. But let's keep it to that. But we see that, you know, we're going to do that. Greeting one another, I mean, everyone likes to hear their name. Everyone likes to hear, hi, how you doing? I mean, how would you feel if you walked in here every weekend and week out and just completely ignored and nobody said anything to you. Never said hello. Never said goodbye. Never asked your name. I doubt you'd come back. You know, um, I've been in instances like that. You know, outside of a church. I remember I was, you know, toying with the idea of practicing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and then I, you know, <laughs> don't go with don't get me started. But I went to this once, this one place, and I went in there, and all the guys are standing around their knees, looking tough, you know, like the weird jiu-jitsu. Do you? <laughs> and I was obviously the new guy because I'm not wearing the. The costume, you know, I've got the sweatpants on it. But you know what? Nobody said hello to me. Wow. Nobody said hi. Nobody came up and shook my hand. And the and the the, the instructor came in, and he said he shook and says, "Have you met the other students?" I said no, and he just turned around and tore into those guys. He's like, "Why would you? Why would you not greet somebody who comes here? If I was him, I wouldn't even want to come back." And you know what? I never did. I mean, it's a little bit of a different situation, but. Right. That, that kind of thing affects people. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing that we need to really work on as a church, or at least maintain. Right. And like I said, it's easy now, but as the church continues to grow, it does get harder to do. And that's just, you know, not to say that it's wrong, it's just a, it's just the facts of the matter. You know, when you're, when you're running 300 up in, in three to 400 people up in Phoenix, and, and I'm only there once a week now, there, I mean, there's people that I never meet that are part of that church, because they don't go to church in front of me. But, you know, they came on Wednesdays, a little but every now and then, they, you know, I'm thinking of, of people that I've met, this has happened more than once recently, where they do show up on Wednesday. I'm like, oh, when did you get here? And they've been, I've been here six months. Wow. I'm like, oh, sorry. You know, what was your name again? And they, and, and, you know, but the people understand. I mean, it's hard to just physically sometimes get across the auditorium and shake somebody's hand. But I wonder how much we can improve in that area, all of us, if when a visitor came in or we saw some face we didn't know, we'd say, I'm going to make a point of at least going and shaking their hand and saying hello. Right. And here's the thing, it doesn't take a lot in this area. You know, you don't necessarily have to sit down and get their life story. You know, uh, sometimes I'll, if I see somebody that I don't know, I'll say, I'm going to, because normally now when I go to church in Phoenix, there's several faces I'll say, I don't know who those people are. And if I can at least every service just make a point of going and seeing one person or one couple that I've never met and just saying, hello, what's your name, where are you from? And spend two minutes. I mean, that could go so far with people, that kind of a thing. And we don't want to have that, that reputation of, of a church that doesn't greet each other, that doesn't greet people, that just kind of sits back and says, well, let's see how long you can hang in there before I come and shake your hand. <clears throat> so... That's not the attitude that we should have. We should be willing to go out and greet one another and to say hello. Amen. And you know, and Paul commanded that, but go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 16. 
Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna read Romans chapter 16. I know it's a bunch of names, but Paul. I mean, look at what Paul took the time to do here in Romans chapter 16. He didn't just talk the talk. Paul walked the walk. He begins in verse one. I commend you unto Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, of, which is at uh, Centria. They receive her, and the Lord has become a saint. And then your sister, whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a sucker of many, and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. Unto whom not only I gave thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinatus, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andri Andricus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoner, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ Jesus, who were in Christ before me. Great, uh, greet Ampilus, uh, my beloved in the Lord. Uh, salute Urbane, our, our, our helper in Christ, and Stachus, uh, or Stachus, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are in Aristopolis' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be in the houses, household of Narcissus, which, is, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute and uh, beloved Persisus, which labored, <coughs> excuse me, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute and strike and, and Scritus. These are hard to, to say, let alone sit down and write them all, right? Uh, Phlega and Hermit, Hermes, uh, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philogus and Julia, Nereus, and her sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. You know, not just these, all these people that I just named, but also everybody else that's with them. Salute those people. Salute one another with a an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. I mean, he's commanding them this long list of specific people that Paul has had on his mind, right. saying, you need to go salute these people. Say hello to one another. You know, don't just greet the new people, but say hello to that brother that's been around for a while, the one that you know is going to be there anyway, whether you say hello or not. Why not just go get to know him a little bit better, too? <clears throat> you know, I kind of doubt, you know, I struggled to read it, but I doubt Paul struggled to sit down and write it. These were people that he probably had on his heart. These were probably people that he was thinking about. And he probably could have written a lot more names, but didn't for, sake, for the sake of time. He likely had to cut it short. But really what it's giving us, and you say, why is that even in the Bible? Well, it's really giving us an example and commands us to do likewise. He says, look, Paul is greeting all these people that he cares about. We need to have that same heart and, and greet one another. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are uh, with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. I mean, this is something the Bible touches on over and over again, just the simple act of saluting one another. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5. You know, <clears throat> it, was, it was interesting there that he says in 1 Thessalonians, Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. You know, sometimes we struggle to remember people's names, and sometimes we struggle to, to remember to greet people. But I think if we would have a little bit of a prayer list, and I'm not saying you have to have a prayer list with 350 to 400 names on it, but maybe you could start putting some names on a prayer list or say, meet somebody and say, hey, I'm going to pray for that person. Amen. And if you started to do that, you start to remember that person, you start to think about that person, and you probably, when you saw them, that person that you've been praying for, you'd probably be more inclined to go shake their hand and see how they're doing. Amen. And you never know what might happen. You know, they might express to you some burden that they're having, and you might pray about it. And the next day you go and, and, and greet them, or the next time you see them, you greet them, and they tell you something, and, it, and you know that, it's an, that a prayer has been answered. That kind of thing happens. So, but you'll never experience that if you never go just simply meet people and right. greet one another. <clears throat> so we should greet one another, we should pray for one, an one another, and we should, uh, what's another just practical way here that we can um, learn to be a good influence on one another, to love the brethren, as the Bible commands us to do. You know, saluting one another and greeting one another, that's a big one. That's, that's a big theme in the New Testament. It's something that we're commanded to do over and over again. We see great examples of people doing it, great men of God doing it. But how about just being polite and courteous? You know, not just walking up, hey, what's your name? Yeah, great. All right. You know, you could do it with a little bit more, uh, you know, being polite and courteous to one another. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 8, Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. So we are to be courteous one another and, and to be kind to one another. 
here's another one uh, that that we you know that might be uh, something we need to make sure we're we're being careful to do if we're going to love the brethren, and that is to forgive each other. Because as I said at the beginning of the sermon, it's only a matter of time until somebody offends you. It's only a matter of time until somebody in church says or does the right or wrong thing that's just going to upset you. Uh, if you would, turn over to uh, Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 17 says this, He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. You know, if somebody offends you, you don't have to let them know about it. You don't always have to go and say, hey, you made me upset. And you certainly don't have to let somebody else know about it and go, hey, you know, so-and-so did this to me. The Bible says, he that covereth the transgression seeketh love. You know, maybe that if when, that when somebody offends you or does something, maybe you could just cover it and just keep it hidden and just forget it. You say, you know what, I just want to forgive them and just move on and just love them. When you're doing that, a type of person who is going to just willing to just oversee a transgression to just cover it and forget that it's even there is the type of person that's seeking love. That same verse goes on and says, but he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. You know, he's not going to let it go. He's going to keep repeating it in his mind. Or worse, he's going to repeat the fence back unto them. This tit for tat type of thing. They're going to do unto them the same thing that was done to them. Or they're going to repeat the matter to somebody else. Say, hey, so and so. And I've, I've had this happen in my own life. Where I've offended somebody and instead of them coming to me and talking about it, they went and talked to other people that, that knew us. And I could tell that they were because those people started treating me different. And sure enough, in time, it comes out, oh yeah, so-and-so said this, and you did that, you did this. I never heard about it. But they don't have any problem going repeating that matter to somebody else. And what happens? They separate it very friends. I mean, whole friendships, relationships can be just be destroyed simply because you're not willing to just let it go and just cover a transgression and seek love. Look at Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. You know, the discretion of a man deferreth anger. You know, so it takes the discretion to, to sit there and not let your emotions get a hold of you and run wild and just start repeating the matter. It takes some discretion to defer it, you know, to just say, you know what, I'm just going to deflect that. I'm just going to put that aside. I'm just going to forget that that happened. <clears throat> it's the discretion that is what it takes to be able to defer your anger in that way. But it goes on and says that it is his glory to pass over a transgression. You know, I think when we just let things go, when we just let things slide off our back, we just don't get upset about things that maybe, maybe even we'd be right to be upset about. Maybe if we could just forget about those things, I think sometimes God sees that and he says, and he blesses us for it. And it becomes a glory unto us. And God you know, will return the favor when we offend him. So those are just some practical ways tonight that we can love the brethren. You know, it's not, it's not a profound sermon, but it's one of those things that really have to be in a church. That If they're going to make a great church and if this church is going to continue to grow, and new people are going to come in and be added to this church and are going to want to come back. I mean, if visitors are going to come out and, and visit here, you know, and I don't, again, I don't think we struggle with this. That, we had a visitor come in the other day and, and, and there was like a line of people waiting to shake his hand and get it to know him. So I think that's great. But let's not lose sight of that. Let's not forget that. Right? Yeah. Because these are the type of things that bring people back. Because that's a lot of times what people are looking for. Yeah. Not everyone's going to walk into a church just saying, hey, I'm looking to look to someone who's going to rip my face off with the Bible. That's what I'm here for. A lot of people are just coming in because they want to make some friends. Yeah, right. Because they just want to get to know some people. Yeah. And, and they're hurting or they have some needs and they, <clears throat> they want people to care about them. <clears throat> so there are just some real practical ways that we could just show people that we think about them, that we love them, you know, phone calls, greeting one another, sending a message, just talking to them, letting them know, praying for them on our own, um, and helping them out when needed, like moving, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but we have to understand something, that loving one another is a powerful influence. I mean, it can make or break ministries sometimes. It can make a church, a great church, an even better church. And it's a very powerful influence that we can have. And not only that, but it's a command. And, you know, I don't have the time to sit here and have, go through this list of scripture I have that we are commanded um, to, 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 to just love one another. But let's not forget, it is the second greatest commandment. Right. To love thy neighbor as thyself. For upon, uh, upon these two uh, commandments hang, all, hang the law and the prophets. That if we would just learn to do unto others as we have to do unto, uh, unto us, you know, uh, we would have just better relationships with one another. And we would be able to fulfill that command that we're, we are to have, that, that, that we have been commanded to fulfill, which is to love the brethren. Let's go ahead and pray.